Wow, what a morning. Happy spring. Thank you all for being here today. I am very grateful to be here today, and I'm going to ask a question. How many ministers do you think go out on a Saturday night and get home at 1 a.m.? <laughs> it was all in divine order. It was, uh, and I'll share a little bit about that. My talk title today is Orchestrating My Life, and it's a borrowed talk title. And the concert I went to, in case some of you haven't seen my Facebook post, was the Rick Springfield concert. And he has had a huge influence on my spiritual journey, how I do life, how I show up in life through his music. And the latest album title for his new album is called Orchestrating My Life. So when I was trying to think about what I wanted to call this talk when Reverend Nicole and Reverend Michael were gracious enough to offer to allow me to speak today on my last official Sunday with all of you, I was thinking, leap of faith, my journey, the journey, I had all these talk titles going through my head. And then I heard what Rick's new album was, which is Orchestrating My Life, and I went, that's it. And I know that because his concert last night was postponed from February. So it was last night, and there were 100 people on stage. 80 of them were uh, musicians uh, for a symphony. They were high school students. And uh, plus his whole band and backup singers, it was quite a night. Um, but as I sat there and was listening to the music and kind of taking it all in, I realized the conductor for that, uh, the orchestra, was the one kind of putting everything together so we could hear it and understand it and enjoy the music. And they all came together, 100 people on stage came together to provide an amazing two-hour concert that I'm still flying high on um, with only five hours of sleep that something has to keep me going. Um, but it was a gift. It was a gift because it's who we show up as. And that's what Rick was talking about in orchestrating my life, how he's shown up over decades of music. And as a little side note, the song Jesse's Girl, he shared last night that Jesse, in actuality, is 60 now. <laughs> <laughs> so we've all grown over the years. I've been blessed to be in Science of Mind for over 30. Um, there's a Emerson quote, the only person you are destined to become is the person you decide to become. Isn't that true? If Rick hadn't answered the call back when he was young to create the music he does, I might not be standing here. Because there were a lot of gifts I've gotten over that. If I hadn't heard Debbie and Bill in Huntington Beach, I might not have participated in a concert that Eric Strom did, Dream the Impossible Dream. That was another possibility for my talk title. Because in that one, and you've all heard me share that, I got the courage, that was a God thing, to participate, not to be behind the scenes like I usually was. I was running spotlights that day, and something said to step into the actual show, and I did. I had to say yes. I had to answer the call. I had to hear that was within me, the music that I was to play. I think it's Wayne Dyer who said, don't die with the music still in you. Are we? There's a quote by Caroline Mace. You can pretend to be something other than who you are, but eventually you will run out of energy to continue because that's not authentically you. Pretty easy to step into something we're not and to find the courage to who we are. Reverend Nicole does raises and praises during the service, and I'm choosing to do it during my talk. And the first people I want to raise and praise are Reverend Michael, Reverend Nicole, and Reverend Juanita. Because the gift, yes. Because the gift of who you are has helped me on my journey. The four of us have come together in the last two years to grow our own ministries, to support one another, to support our beautiful center, and we've gotten to fly. I think of Nicole as a soul sister, not just a colleague. Reverend Michael and I have worked together, Reverend Juanita and I in pastoral care, and they've all been there for me in moments where I've had a difficult time, but they were there to hold the prayer with a few other people. One of them is here today. He's not in our, in our denomination, but he's been a huge support to me over the last five years. Couldn't have done it without him. His prayers, his support, his showing up. We all have that opportunity to do that for one another. Do we show up? 
and I think he knows who he is, I won't say his name, and, but it's a gift to answer that call. The conductor pieces all that together, that's the divine in our lives, that's the conductor guiding and directing us, but we have to answer the call. We have to listen to that still small voice. There's a book called Led by Divine Design. I was drawn to it by its title. It was actually a Christmas present to myself. And what I liked in this book was, first, the title. We're all here by divine design. But there was a story that the author talked about from when he was eight. And he didn't quite understand what the still small voice was. In his denomination, he calls it the Holy Ghost. And he's kind of antsy, and he's in Sunday school. And his teacher asks him to read something in front of the class. And he's not sure if he can do it, but he does it. And as he gets through reading what he's been asked to read, he realizes he's heard the still small voice. And from that space, he's directed the rest of his life and what he's called to do today. We all have that opportunity to hear the still small voice. It comes from within us in our own way, in our own time. And we have that seed, I'll call it a divine seed that's within us to orchestrate our life, but we have to say yes. We have to continually say yes. I love the one mind. I know we're talking about Ernest Holmes today too, and in your program under the notes section, there's a quote from Ernest Holmes, and I did not call Julie with this one. However, it's in there, and it's prepare your mind to receive the best that life has to offer. Stepping into this new role as an assistant minister is a dream come true. It's a lot of prayer work. Marjorie, earlier this morning, one of our beloved practitioners and a dear friend, said that she thought I was blossoming. We're all blossoming. We're all stepping into a greater yet to be. We have to say yes. We have to prepare ourselves for that which we're feeling called to do and find the courage to step into it, not just once, not just twice, but on a continual basis. You have to have that opportunity. Ernest Holmes says, in How to Change Your Life, the ability to attain your goals, to control your experiences, and have them result in happiness, prosperity, and success lies in your own mind and the way you use it. This means you control your own experiences. You are really in charge of your affairs and the way they are to develop. Because we have to say yes. Ernest Holmes said that he would rather have somebody live our principles than be able to quote every word in the science of mind. That takes an embodiment, empowering ourselves to embody these teachings and take them out into the world. And I think we all do that. There's uh, a children's book called uh, The Invisible String. And I don't know if any of you have read it, but it's a powerful book. It's a kid's book, but it talks about when you can't be in the same room with a loved one. And oftentimes, little kids get scared when they go off to school. I don't know if it's the parents or the kids. Um, but it's a combination, remembering my child um, when she went, started going to school. But the invisible stream talks about there's something that connects us on a heart level that we can't see, but we can feel. No matter where we're at in the world or what we're doing, we're connected. So even when I'm not here on a Sunday morning, I am keeping my practitioner license here, so you'll see me at different events. Reverend Juanita and I are doing the Good Friday service. I'm really looking forward to that service. Um, that service has special meaning to me for a few reasons. One, last year, it'll be a different day, but last year, just before the service, Bill and Dean came and shared some news with me, and we got to pray. And from that experience, reminded me of how life is, how it's not, how short it can be, and the importance to love. So I'm looking forward to the Good Friday service this year because I remember that memory from a year ago. His presence is still with us, will always be there. He reminds us of love, just like the invisible string. So even if I'm not here, we're connected. You're my family. You watched me grow over the last however many years. I think it's been seven years that I've been here. I'm not going anywhere. Reverend Josh, I'll never forget, I was a practitioner student and he had said, when the universe offers you something, you say yes. I said no. <laughs> Actually, I think I said no, thank you. <laughs> and he said, when the universe offers you something, you say yes, then you figure it out. You and God will figure it out. I got an offer. I said yes. It was bittersweet. I wasn't sure. 
called Reverend Nicole crying on the phone. I told her I'd talk today as long as I was allowed to cry. She said yes. <laughs> it is a bittersweet time, but it's a reminder of the divine expressing itself through us all the time. I've made many friends, and I've had this opportunity to remember who we are. Reverend Josh, in his book, Loose Change, says a few things, and when Janice read from it last week, it made me pick up my copy and read it again. He says, your choices are the single most creative force in your life. Not what happens to you, not what you want to happen, but what you choose. And what you choose is not a one-time decision. It is a moment-by-moment -moment practice. The more you invest your choices and awareness of what you want in your life, the more constructive your choices become. He goes on to say, when you choose what you do not want, you become who you do not want to be. Ask yourself, at the end of the day, what do the choices I make say about who I am? Do these choices match up with who I want to be? Every choice you make either brings you closer or further away from who and what you want to become. The fulfillment of a major choice in your life rarely takes place with one choice but with one choice and countless more supporting it. The only thing that separates you from your good is your ability to make the choices that get you there. There is no <coughs> limit to what you can choose if you're willing to become who you need to be to achieve it. And what is that? What is it that you choose to be? Ernest Holmes says in Thoughts or Things, we are successful in experiencing what we want or what we don't want. This brings us to the question, what do we think about most of the time, the wants or the don't wants? It also reminds me of the story Wayne Dyer shared. Someone went on a, a shopping spree. They had like $1,500 to spend. They walked into the first shop and there were a couple of rugs that they thought were just hideous. They thought they were awful, but they were the in thing, so they bought two and had them sent home. Went to the next door, found some lamps, didn't like them. But again, they were popular. So they ordered a few, had them sent home. And this continued through the day until they got home and realized, I don't like anything in my house. <laughs> you bought it. Was it because you thought you were supposed to have these because they're the in thing or they're the most expensive? Or is it because it was calling to your heart? That's the divine calling to your heart expressing who you are, what it is you're feeling called to do. My favorite thing in my home right now is a candle holder I got at the Dollar Tree. Yeah. It's beautiful. It reminds me of the light within. It reminds me of the light within each and every one of us. Do I tell somebody it came from the Dollar Tree? I just did. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Because it reminds me of the spiritual truth of who I am. And that's why I feel called to do what I do in the world. It's to show up and be present. My mission statement is to be a beneficial presence. I don't know if I am, but I hope I am. What is your mission statement? What is it that's orchestrating your life? I know it's the divine underneath, but do you? Even if we don't hear the call, doesn't mean it's not happening. We believe in our faith that there is a divine order, a high order unfolding for e with ease and with grace, even though it might not feel like it because of the appearance. But the truth is, there's always that divine seed of perfection. It's showing up at the perfect time, whether it's your time or God's time, because there's divine timing. Sometimes they're in alignment. And it's that opportunity to hear and feel and sense and know that truth. There's a story of a wealthy farmer who had worked really hard his whole life to create this beautiful ranch. And he had a son who didn't really care about it. He was young kind of doing his own thing, going out and partying, not paying attention. And as the rancher made his transition, the property was left to his son, who didn't know what to do. So he left it alone, continued his behaviors. He was out all night. He was out with friends, didn't come home. And pretty soon, everything kind of fell into disrepair. And then he thought, what am I going to do? Everything around me is not what I want. So he went to the town sage and asked for some advice. And the town sage gave him a box. He said, don't open it, but I want you every morning and every night to sprinkle it 
all corners of your property every morning and every night. So he did that every day. And as he continued to do that, he realized a fence needed to be mended. That's how his cows were getting out. So he came back during the day and fixed it. And then he continued around, spending more and more time and realizing other things in his property needed to be fixed. So he was taking the time and the energy to do that. And before he knew it, it was back to beautiful order. And he realized something in him had shifted. He wasn't doing the things that he used to do. He was finding another opportunity to do something that he felt he was called to do. For us, those are our spiritual practices. And when he was towards the end of his life, someone saw the box and had asked him what was in that box. And he said, I don't know. I was told never to open it, just to sprinkle it, which I did. So they opened the box and it was sand. Was it the sand that helped bring everything back into alignment? No. It was the time and the attention and the commitment that had shifted for him. And that's what the gift was. It wasn't the sand. So for us, the sand might be our spiritual practices. But what it's really doing is bringing us into alignment with that higher truth. We're answering the call. For those of you who know, I love the Wednesday evening service, which we now call the Wednesday evening experience. And Michael Paul Smith spoke a few weeks ago. God's calling. He says hi. <laughs> And Michael talked about answering the call in his talk. And for those of you who don't know, this Wednesday, I'm putting a plug in for the Wednesday evening service, my last chance. Um, it's Anton Miserac and Laura Berry Hill. They're both amazing musicians and storytellers. They're from Mount Shasta. Uh, they'll open your heart in ways that you can't even imagine. They do a lot from the Celtic tradition. So come on Wednesday if you can. But when Michael was talking at that Wednesday night service, I felt like he was talking to me. I was sitting over there. It's where I usually sit. And he said, are we answering the call? I had to think about it. I got a text in the middle of that talk from the Fountain Valley Church saying, I need to talk to you tomorrow. And I went, oh, OK. So the next day, I received the offer. And I went, oh, that's divine timing if I haven't seen it before. But I really had to go deep within in prayer work to hear it. What was the answer? And it was yes. What is calling to your heart? What is orchestrating your life? What is being orchestrated in your life? I want you to think about that in your own way. Because each and every one of us has that opportunity. In German, there is two words that I really like. They take the place of goodbye. One is Auf Wiedersehen, which means I will see you again. And Auf Wiederhören, which means I'll hear from you again. Those two words speak to my heart about how I feel about all of you. I will continue to be around. I'm grateful for the love, the presence you've all been there for me, the opportunities for me to serve. And it's not goodbye. It's I'll see you. I'll hear from you. I will reach out. And when we answer that call, when we hear and sense and know that truth, what do you think happens in our lives? Anybody want to share? Yeah. You wake up and become practitioners. Actually, Ernest Holmes said we're all practitioners. Some of us are practitioners with a capital P, because we went through classes and exams and panels and all kinds of things. I did that in 2003. Never forgot that experience. But what Ernest Holmes taught was we're all practitioners. We all show up. And yes, we hear the call. So if you hear the call, say yes. I never thought I'd stand up here in front of you. When I was ordained, I was ordained to the role of pastoral minister. Never thought I'd want to do this, and now I love it. Stretched out of my comfort zone. I said yes, but I had opportunity, love, encouragement for many of you to do that and opportunities. Anybody else? I like that one. Thank you. Joy. Joy. Yes. What did you say? Openness. Openness. Yeah. Alignment. Alignment. Love. Speaking of love, you've all received a purple heart. Not the military purple heart. I picked a purple heart for a few reasons. One, I love hearts, as many of you know. They remind me of love. They remind me of the invisible string that wherever we're at, we can love. 
Our anatomical heart keeps us living, keeps us breathing, it has to beat. One of the songs Rick Springfield sang last night was Four Billion Heartbeats, and it was in memory of his mom who'd made his, her transition two years ago. And he estimated that's how many heartbeats she had in her lifetime. She was 96 when she died. So that last night, I was reminded the heartbeat of love, of life, continuing. The purple represents spirituality, an alignment with higher truth. And when we are reminded that no matter where we go, the heart of who we are is our center. The heart of who we are is the divine, expressing itself as our center. Our symbol is from Jonathan Livingston Siegel. Not our teaching symbol, but our stained glass symbol. It's, it's an adaptation of our teaching and a reminder of flying. Jonathan Livingston Siegel wanted to fly, and he did. It's a reminder for us to fly. I really feel that when we orchestrate our life, when we continually make choices for our highest and best good, whatever those choices are, we have an opportunity to express the divine. God is always having its way with us because it's deep within us. That's why we're here to express alignment, truth, love, joy, blossoming, all the words that we didn't even hear out there because it's that invisible string, the divine guiding and directing in every moment. For me, the orchestrator in my life is the divine. I have to answer the call. I have to do the action steps. Ernest Holmes said, treat and move your feet, which means I pray, and then I have to take action. I can pray all day long, but it's not going to help if I don't step and say yes. Just like when Dream the Impossible Dream came out and I asked to come out as a religious science minister at 18, I had no idea what that meant. I was still in the first class, Science of Mind 1. Back then it was called Science of Mind 1. I had no idea 30-some years later I'd be a minister. But I planted that seed 30-some years ago. How long do you think it takes to show up? For some of us, a while. Some of us, instantaneously. But it's always in divine order. Always. Everything in our world is in divine order. I'm going to close in prayer. Turning within in prayer, I recognize and know that right here and right now, who I am is the divine expression of God. Recognizing and knowing there's only that one life, that one mind, that one God, it is my life right now. It is the life of each and every one of us here. It shows up in unique, creative ways because we are all individualized expressions of God. Grateful to recognize and know that as Ernest Holmes spoke, there's a power greater than us and we can use it. That power is God. That power is love. That power is infinite wisdom and clarity. It is the love that we have for one another. That is what we are taught, love one another. It is that opportunity to say yes. It is the opportunity to say yes, even in the midst of fear or change, because I recognize and know it is all God. I absolutely know that within each and every one of us is a divine expression, expressing itself magnificently through each and every one. Grateful for this time together, grateful to know that God is walking us home, God is walking with us in every path, in every journey, and I call it good and very good because I absolutely know we are embodiments of that one life. Recognizing that invisible string of love through each one of us, grateful for that knowing that I carry that in my heart as I move forward. Grateful for the path ahead and grateful for the love of all those that I carry in my heart. As I release my word into the law, I know each and every one of us are enfolded in that divine love, the divine guidance, the divine presence. How can we not? We are one. I say thank you, God, as I release my word into the law. It is done. It is absolutely perfect. And so it is. Thank you. Thank you so much.